Our first guest is Sylvia Van. Uh, Sylvia is a senior manager at the Southern Migrant and Refugee Center, and she has worked in aged care for over 23 years, in uh, both in multicultural and mainstream non-for-profit organizations. Throughout her career with the Southern Migrant and Refugee Center, she has established over 25 social support programs, servicing 26 different um, ethnicities in Melbourne Southeast. She has also been instrumental in, in establishing consumer advisory groups for aged care. Let me just tell you a little bit about SMRC. So that's abbreviated for the Southern Migrant and Refugee Center. Established in um, 1993, SMRC has been dedicated in assisting newly arrived refugees in settling into their new communities. And we achieve these um, through tailored programs focusing on social and economic integration, as well as health and well-being. Our services uh, encompass a wide range of supports, and this includes early childhood education, youth programs, education initiatives, driving programs, individual casework, employment assistance, aged care, and support for carers. Today in itself, um, because we're talking about aged care, I'm actually going to be presenting on aged care services. So SMRC is funded to deliver the Commonwealth Home Support Program, as well as uh, carer and aged care volunteer visitor scheme services. We have really been uh, successful in delivering these um, services since the transition of home care, home and community care program um, in 2016. And we have a suite of CHSP Hack PYP, which is the home care um, program for younger people, uh, carer services. These services under the CHSP is specialized support services, social support groups and individuals, domestic assistance and also the Allied Health Therapy Service, uh, center-based respite. Funded under the Department of Health and Aged Care is our Aged Care Volunteer Visitor Scheme and funded under the State Department of Health is our Support for Carers Program. So there's actually quite a fair few um, CHSP services, but I'm gonna expand a little bit more onto our social support groups in itself. So we currently have 24 social support programs. Out of these 24, um, we have eight center-based programs. We have um, eight positive aging programs, and this range from strength training, um, which is um, held at the gym, uh, or, and, and or, sorry, warm water programs. We also have five ethno-specific outing programs um, that ranges from Spanish, um, Filipino, um, Turkish, Romanian, and Indian outing programs. We have one community garden, gardening program that operates five days a week, one creative arts program, one dance program, and servicing well over 500 clients. So how did we come about in getting our suite of services? SMRC really has um, successfully implemented these programs based on responsive consumer or client-centric care. And what this means is that we have focused um, on what the needs are within our community or the individual, identifying what their, net, uh, their gaps are and challenges, and then trying to actually tailor these programs that will support them. So some of these programs I'm going to elaborate a little bit on, but these are the main ones that really came about from focusing on um, responsive uh, client needs. And that's our Afghan ladies program. Our hive, the community garden came about the same way where we have identified an individual that really um, enjoyed gardening, you know, and we couldn't actually find a, a social program that will allow him to actually ex, uh, express, you know, what his enjoyment was. So we did a bit of a community survey and found that, you know, we there were actually others amongst him that was also keen in community gardening. And likewise, with our Dance Up, our creative arts program, the NRCP, for those that have been here long enough, would know that that stands for the National Respite Carers Program way back, and that seeded up into our center-based respite program. Back in 2005, 
that was really when the journey really all started. SMRC really only had three center-based programs and they were um, tailored to um, specific um, ethno-specific groups. They were a Spanish program, a Filipino program, and a mixed cultural program. Within the Filipino program, we identified that there were concerns among our Filipino participants with high incidence of type 2 diabetes post-migration. So what we did was responding to this, we um, applied and secured for funding from the state level to deliver a Well for Life program. Um, and we engage a nutritionist to empower this group with the knowledge on healthy eating through label reading, health education, and then assisting them in transforming recipes into nutrition, um, nutritious um, alternatives. So this, this pathway in itself later led um, to SMRC establishing our very first strength training program slash social group, you know, as we continue to empower our communities on healthy um, living. So the same thing went with the Afghan ladies program, because we are very fortunate to have our SETS program, which looks after settlement. Um, we had also identified that there were a group of Afghan ladies, older Afghan ladies, that were really isolated in connecting with social programs. So what we did was we held a community consultation with the leaders as well as with these ladies. And we asked them what was it they wanted to do, you know, how they wanted to be engaged into a social program. Many of them actually fed back that they would enjoy some some sort of a well-being program. So we gave them suggestions and we actually trialed our first Afghan ladies program by resourcing a female um, strength trainer. We had this over in the office. We had to um, educate people on how to respond, you know, to um, having this program where we put signage up that there was a program that was there. We blocked out all the shades and the blinds we taught the women how to actually um, dress appropriately for the, the exercise program. We provided um, training, cultural training to the instructor. We couldn't get a Dari speaking trainer. So we had um, an, an English speaking trainer, but we had to give her the training to actually educate her. And then we piloted it. And when we piloted, we were very respectful of what and how the ladies wanted to actually engage, you know, um, from the footwear, we educated them onto the appropriate footwear to the proper attire for exercises through to hydration. And throughout all this, we constantly had a feedback and um, evaluation process that will help us, that would have helped us to actually um, continue to improve on the program. I'm very happy to say that this program continues until today. It, it, it is now actually held at a women's section in the local gym. And these ladies actually access the program on their own outside of SMRC. So these are some of the things that um, we have actually done to provide um, the social inclusion. From this, you will find that our programs are developed from the lens and the needs of our communities. And what this means is that we recognize what our community's needs are. We identify new and emerging communities and we engage by, and by asking them what matters to them. You know, we uh, ensure that um, we are supporting them in every way and where referrals need to be made, we've got a team that can manage that as well. And then we respond to some of their needs via um, various engagement. So we consult, we plan with them, we meet with them, um, and then we plan internally and externally as well. We ask ourselves what is actually feasible and what is not, because not all programs are feasible to actually um, run, you know, and that also depends on the cost. What is the cost within our budget? Um, what is it that we would need? How is it that we can partner up with somebody else if we are restricted to do so? What are the available funds that could actually be out there um, that we could apply for? And then what we do is we pilot these programs um, and we do this sometimes if we need to. 
um, we develop an MOU if necessary. We select the best venues that would offer um, that would often suit our communities. So venues are also important. It's what they are familiar with and not just where we feel that the programs will be held. And then as we actually embed the programs, we continue to discuss um, the needs and the improvements with our communities, with the participants. And this is where our consumer advisory comes in as well. And we try to integrate and interact with them with other programs as well. Throughout all this, we have a robust um, evaluation tool. Um, and this is really necessary all the way through so that we can change the programs and improve the programs. So agility is another thing that needs to be considered when you're actually running community programs, because some community programs don't always, you know, they might think that this is what they would like, but eventually when they embark into the programs, they might feel that this is not what it was. So how do we actually change some of the styles of the program? and be prepared to actually find a pathway that the programs can evolve into something. And this is really the Dance Up program. We applied for funding with the Dance Up program and um, we've managed to now, once that funding ceased, get the program into a social support funded, funded program where they are continuing with that program as well. SMRC has continued to operate from the lens, you know, from this lens of um, responsive care since 2005 and by responding to our community's needs as well. Risa is a regional advisor for sector support and development across the eastern metropolitan area of Melbourne and has worked extensively in the community aged care sector for over 20 years. Um, she has training and quality improvement background. She works with Commonwealth Home Support Program providers to support their engagement with the aged care reforms. A focus of her work is to ensure all the people can access services that are inclusive, person-centered, and supportive of their individual preferences, beliefs, values, and needs. Thank you so much for welcoming me here today. And I'd particularly like to thank Sylvia for sharing the Southern Migrant Resource uh, Centre's very practical experience of delivering social support programs. And while I don't actually work in a social support setting, I'm very fortunate to be in a sector support and development role in the Eastern Metropolitan Area of Melbourne, where I get to work with lots of providers who deliver social support programs. So today what I'm going to be sharing with you is their experiences, which is actually uh, the subject of a project and a resource um, that we're going to be looking at today. So I think it's important to mention that within the context of developing the resource that I'm going to be sharing, we acknowledge that there are potentially two categories of people. So we have those who have migrated to Australia in their younger years and grown up um, or grown older in Australia, and of course those who were already older when they arrived. And I think it's important for us all to remember, um, you know, research tells us that it's likely that the latter group, um, that older people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are likely to experience um, greater barriers to accessing aged care. But I suppose irrespective of the migration circumstances, the benefits of ethno-specific social support groups are really well documented. But what happens when those groups don't have availability or they don't exist for a particular language group? Or perhaps they don't offer activities that suit everybody or people prefer to be part of a mainstream group. So these are some of the important questions that really led our team to ask, 
how could mainstream English speaking social support groups build culturally inclusive and welcoming environments for people who speak little or no English? And were there good examples of where this was actually happening in our region? Fortunately, the answer to the second question was yes, it was happening. Um, and we actually engaged the Centre for Cultural Ethnicity and Health to complete a six-month research process. Um, and this kind of involved considerable consultation with our key, stakeholder, key stakeholders, which included, of course, um, cold social support participants and carers. And we gathered information through interviews, through focus groups and direct observations of social support groups in action. And what we actually learned from this research, we've put together in a document that we call Building Culturally Inclusive Social Support Groups. The findings of the uh, consultation that was undertaken landed in sort of three broad areas, if you like. Uh, and importantly, the first of these is that diversity is about more than language. So those who were involved in the research clearly recognised that diversity comes in many forms and staff talked about taking a holistic approach, which really required them to look beyond language and culture. And it was about understanding who the person is and what's important to them. So when we asked people of core backgrounds why they might join a, a social support group, there were some really kind of practical reasons. So things like uh, lack of transport, absence of a particular group in their, in their area or long waiting lists. But, of course, there are also some uh, very specific reasons around people making different choices. You know, um, you might have an older person who wants to maintain their English language after they've left the workforce, and this is a really good opportunity for them to do that. Uh, they may have a particular interest, and so they want to join um, a specific group to meet that need. And that could be things like exercise programs or dance activities that Sylvia mentioned earlier. And, of course, some people told us that they joined mainstream groups because they there was a level of fear um, about judgment from their cultural group, and this might be related to things around ageing or dementia, decreased physical activity, or just the fear of their community knowing all of their business. Interestingly, when we asked providers about the perceived challenges associated with creating a more inclusive um, cultural groups, their feedback indicated that, um, you know, even if we offer a group that is friendly and welcoming, if somebody doesn't speak the same language, then there is issues around isolation. Or if we don't offer activities that interest uh, people from cold communities, you know, they might not relate to the, the footy talk that we have, for example. Um, and then a kind of uh, assumption, I suppose, that people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds um, only want to engage with people from their own community as these um, as they age. And some of these responses are going to be very familiar with you and you may have heard them before, but I suppose it's just a really important reminder that we should not be making assumptions about people's choices, their preferences and their needs based on language and culture alone. Now, some of you may have seen this before. The diversity jigsaw was actually created by my former colleague um, as part of our Connecting the Pieces video and resource which articulates the unique aspects of diversity and person-centred care, the relationship between those approaches and how they influence each other and the need for diversity and person-centred care to be understood throughout the continuum of the client's journey. So the diversity jigsaw that you see on your screen, it demonstrates the personal characteristics, the experiences, the values and beliefs that exist in all of us. And 
you know, each of us is informed by our personal, religious and our political views and our own life experiences. So we are all individuals. And I suppose the idea is, you know, how these diversity pieces um, connect or intersect with each other really tell us about who someone is and what's important to them. I think the key takeaway uh, from this project is that participants in the consultation consistently demonstrated their understanding of the many layers of diversity and that it was more than language, and that enabled them to take a holistic approach to the delivery of social support activities. So evidence gathered in this project identified, uh, I suppose, a few qualities or characteristics of the social support groups to which we spoke. So they see difference as an asset, not a burden. They're flexible, curious, creative, and they are collaborative. And I want to explore these ideas a little bit more because these qualities actually underpin kind of three key principles which drive their inclusive service to delivery model. They use a person-centred approach involving clients in all aspects of decision-making about their project. And I think, um, again, Sylvia really demonstrated this really well. They proactively, um, sorry, they're flexible and really solution-focused. Um, so, and they also are very proactive and seek to develop partnerships with people and groups and different organisations that represent the diversity within their local community. So I've mentioned person-centred care a few times, and I suppose the principles of person-centred care you know, were repeatedly referenced during the consultation. And as I mentioned, they consistently emphasise the importance of taking a holistic view of a person's need. So this is about knowing who they are, what's important to them, and provided specifically tailored service. So they told us, um, you know, that it's often the simple things that make a difference. So paying specific attention to the introduction of new group members, understanding at what point of complexity a person's English language might become insufficient, incorporating food preferences at mealtime, supporting cultural requirements around self-care, um, understanding some of the norms about relationship with other genders or their religious requirements. And this might be things around, you know, fasting or prayer time. They also shared some really practical strategies. Um, a couple of examples, you know, uh, one group learned to tie a hijab for a lady who no longer had the skills. Um, they learned different greetings. They used lots of photos and pictures and visual cues to engage people. Um, they introduced buddy systems and they grouped activities by affinities. So the things that people were interested in, things that bring us together. And they also talked about offering activities that can be demonstrated or required a little explanation, um, you know, things like gentle exercise. Importantly, they kind of, uh, they actively engage their members in identifying and organising those activities and um, suggested that that is a real key to success. And in fact, one of the groups in our study actually handed over decisions about how to spend the activities budget to their members, which um, is a really great uh, initiative. Providers told us that applying a person-centred approach really requires flexibility and a can-do attitude. And I think it's important for us all to remember that social support is not just about filling people's time within a group, it's about enabling meaningful engagement. So taking a strength-based approach and focusing on activities and interests as opposed to deficits. So the groups we spoke to suggested that we need to always be open to new ideas and absolutely take the lead from members. And, you know, not all activities are going to interest everyone, so we need to be mindful about what and how we actually present them. And it's actually okay to make mistakes, you know, trial something. If it doesn't work, that's absolutely fine. 
They also suggested that we need to think about the physical environment. You know, so is the presentation of the space welcoming? Does it instill a sense of belonging? Does it enable uh, a flow that enables people to kind of make choices as they're within the program based on, you know, their preferences of what they want to be involved in on the day? And finally, it probably comes as no surprise that engaging a workforce that embodies the right mix of skills, knowledge and ability, including cultural competence, is critically important. And providers consistently told us that the ability to change, innovate and grow is a lot about recruiting the right people. And that might be your staff or your volunteers. It was also evident from the research that providers that had been successful in com- including people with low English language abilities into their mainstream groups were those who were knowledgeable about their local community and who had developed relationships with ethno-specific groups or multicultural organisations. So making these particular connections really provided the opportunity for creative collaborations, and Sylvia's talked about a few of those today already, Um, but it also supports cultural competence of people within the organisation and, of course, increases your opportunity to attract called staff or volunteers. I mean, I know there's a lot happening in the local area where I live, and I'm sure it's the same for other providers. So, you know, those that we spoke to um, really valued the relationships that they established with their partnership organisations. And they included things like, you know, churches and religious groups, special interest groups like dance and exercise clubs, those kinds of things. Um, And of course, local schools, Um, but also engaging with local one-off events that are happening um, in your local area. Where are there opportunities is the question uh, that we need to be asking ourselves. So you can read and learn more about the experiences of the social support groups that I've shared today um, in the Building Culturally Inclusive Social Support resource. It includes eight help sheets, case studies, and lots of information and practical ideas. So the help sheets each focus on a different aspect of good practice, and they provide kind of hints and tips, ideas and case studies to demonstrate good inclusive practice. You can explore each of the help sheets as a standalone resource. Uh, And of course, we encourage you to use the content to promote discussion within your own programs uh, with staff about how you can make changes to meet the needs of older people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds in your services. The ideas that I have shared with you today are not likely to be new, but I do hope that the information presented just provides you with an opportunity to really reflect reflect on your own organisation's approach. We know there are lots of reforms happening, um, but we also know that the principles and practice of inclusive person-centred care is very strongly aligned with the intent of the proposed new aged care rights uh, Aged Care Act, the Associated Strength and Quality Standards, and of course, existing existing diversity action plans, all of which seek to support consumer choice and control now and into the future. So I've spoken briefly about the findings of the research conducted in our project and the three principles that underpin that good practice, person-centred care, flexibility and adaptability, and diverse partnerships. I suppose it's just important to remember that everybody is starting from a different place. And the first step to becoming more inclusive is really about identifying where there is opportunity for improvement. It's actually okay to acknowledge that you've got work to do. What's important is how you plan and continually improve to ensure that your social support groups are providing a safe and welcoming environment from people from culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds. 
I hope that you um, find the resource helpful in your journey towards more inclusive social support programs. I've included the link there for where you can access it on our Eastern Sector Development Team website. Um, and I'd love to hear your feedback about the resource um, if it's something that you act, uh, if you um, access. So thank you so much for your time today. I think it's a really good question because, you know, you might have a group of, you know, 10 or 20 people, however many, and each person have a different interest. And one of the pieces of advice that providers told us is to set up your rooms with, you know, different activities that are happening at the same time. I appreciate that a lot of the setup is based on, you know, what's physical space you have available, uh, but, you know, having uh, like a cafe style set up where there are different activities and people can make choices about um, how they uh, interact with each of the activities and with different people within the room. Um, so, yeah, it's really about being able to maximise choice. While I have you here, Lisa, I wanted to also ask you, in your presentation, you talked about curiosity. Uh, why do you think that's important? People come along sometimes to a social support program and they're not quite sure of expectations of what they're actually going to get. Um, and it's really about making our programs um we we don't want to fit people into our programs. We want to fit our programs around the people who are actually coming along. And, you know, as your membership changes, it might be that your changes, your program needs to change. And that's absolutely fine. And a lot of that is being curious about and interested um, and engaged with the people who are coming along to the program and understanding what it is that's important to them, um, you know, how they can actually contribute to the planning of the, the sessions. We had um, one social support program where they completely sort of uh, flipped everything around and they had the members actually doing the planning, the budgeting, uh, they decided on what activities were going to be run and they actually went out to Bunnings or, you know, wherever it was to buy the material. And that sort of formed part of what the group did and they really took responsibility for that. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, for a provider that's being very brave because you do have to let go of a certain amount of power, if you like, um, in terms of, you know, organising programs. It's about the person-centered approach. I totally agree. It's um, it's about letting go. For us, what we do is our clients do the planning. We plan um, every quarter and the planning comes from them. So we take a whole day planning and they tell us what they want to do. And everyone gets a turn actually in contributing, depending on how big the group is. The other thing that we tend to practice is because people are unfamiliar with what kind of social programs we offer, we allow them the opportunity to trial the program. So at no cost, you know, we'll just get you to come in. You can trial the center base. You can do an outing program. You can go to a gardening program. You can do a strength training program. And, you know, usually they will find one. Um, and if there isn't any, then we do have a suggestion box. You know, what else would you like us to have a look? But um, you are right, Lisa. It's not about us fitting the program to them. It's about them leading the way. And for providers, you know, nothing could be richer than to actually run a program that is packed with people because they want to be part of this program. So I do think that it's a perception that needs to be adopted. We're talking about um, the Afghan women's group that you were working with. So obviously you're working with a lot of new and emerging communities and um, you have obviously ex years of experience as the Southern Migrant Refugee Center to work with um, recently arrived communities. Is there any advice you can give to aged care providers who haven't yet necessarily engaged with recently arrived communities, what they need to consider, 
how to engage any sort of um, gold nuggets you can give us. Yeah, definitely. It's about actually understanding who your communities are. It's about identifying new and emerging communities because these are the communities that actually struggle to access services. You know, and you can be sure that while the younger generation may need support, there is also the older generation that's missing out. So it's about understanding the community. It's about getting in touch with your local council as well, you know, to find out how you can actually work with your local council in providing some of these support mechanisms building that relationship, that trust, you know, it may be from a small step, but it will take a while. So with our Afghan community, um, because of where the Southern Migrant and Refugee Centre is located in Dandenong, and that's where the cohort of, well, then the cohort of Afghan community were located, we were very fortunate to actually observe, you know, and while a team had actually gone out and delivered services to main, to the younger generation, we were at the back end, um, looking up for the older generation as well. So it's looking holistically at the whole community and not just within an aged care or the young generation or families, you know, but how can we provide services, wraparound services? There are community leaders out there, so people in community who don't have a formal role necessarily, uh, but who who are, um, you know, taking a lead in their community. So find out who, you know, who that who those people are and build those relationships with them as well. And I guess the other thing is that I think, you know, organizations can read out to migrant resource centers, to sector support and development teams um, and your local, um, you know, multicultural community group or peak bodies as well to co-design or reach out to the center as well. Our um, social um, programs are all led by Certificate for Trained Lifestyle Therapists. Um, we work in our strength training programs. Um, we work with gyms. We work with the fitness instructors. Um, and we have exercise physiologists as well that will attend to the assessments um, of our clients. But um, the main thing, definitely, we, we, we use qualified workforce. Um, it's actually creating... There are two folds to this. It's actually while looking at the qualified workforce, it's also creating a pathway for the clients to continue with these programs outside of our time. So not just one day a week that they'll be coming for a social support slash strength training program, but during the other days, they can actually foster their own um, relationships. And that depends on the individual's capacity to do that. I have another question as well, and that was around the interpreting and language services. When we, when you were working with communities and doing the community consultations, were you working with interpreters? Were you working with bilingual staff? Were you using simple English? What sort of, how you sort of facilitated the community consultations? Yeah, we work with our bicultural workforce. So we do have bicultural workers that are part of the community. Um, and this actually came about from COVID-19 that we actually established this bicultural workforce. Prior to that, we um, SMRC has been very fortunate because we've got um, 56 different languages that we can actually tap into from our own workforce in itself. So yes, we do actually work with our workforce. You were talking also about diverse partnerships. We'd like to elaborate a little bit on diverse partnerships. Yeah, I mean, one of the pieces of um, advice that came from the social support providers that we spoke to was, you know, it's so important to know your local community. And so, you know, there are lots of groups out there that run, um, that are not government funded. Um, they may not even be um, supported through a council or whatever. They're just different groups that have been set up. Um, so, you know, finding out who those are, and a lot of those um, I know in our area they found were, were church-based for or faith-based, for example. Um, so, you know, understanding where those groups are and making connections with them um, really, you know, basically what they told us was that helped them to uh, build their own cultural competence but also 
create a pathway, I suppose, for referrals into a program. And so it was about building a level of trust between the social support program and the actual community. So, you know, looking for those. There are lots of organisations out there who, um, you know, who are interested in supporting um, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. It's just a matter of finding someone who's actually going to match um, you know, the same space that you're interested in. So, yeah, and I think um, what they told us was that if they are able to build those connections, build that trust, um, they're more likely to um, attract volunteers from that community within their own programs, for example. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, even I'm thinking about um, there was an organisation that was working with a local school and, of course, the schools are very representative um, of of, um, diversity within the community, you know. Um, Yeah, so, you know, I think there's just lots of opportunity. It's just a matter of going out and and finding them. If we put ourselves in the centre of what we want to actually receive and how we would like the response of care to actually be delivered, I don't think you'll get it wrong. You know, um, I think in one of your slides, Lisa, you actually um, mentioned, you know, that um, it's no different to what you would want as well, you know, in your social programs. So why would we do anything different for somebody else? Thank you very much, Lisa and Sylvia. Thanks everybody for participating and we hope to see you at our next webinar.